Amen. And I am not here trying out for the position of your preacher. I don't know about you, but I've had a good day today, and I know that you're tired because I'm tired, and uh, I shouldn't say this because my wife will tell you that the very minute I tell you I'm going to be brief, you can automatically tack at least 10 minutes onto it, but I'll try not to let that happen. When I was a student at Freed Hardman many, many years ago, Brother William Woodson was the chairman of the Bible department, and uh, he was quite uh, stern sometimes with us young preacher students, and so sometimes we would not uh, get right into the lesson as it were, and he would simply interrupt and say, get on with it. So if I don't get on with it, then we may never get done tonight. But as John Wayne would say in such a time as this, he said, let's get on with the rat killing. So let's get to it. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, the inspired account there bespeaks of two choices that befall all of mankind. Paul writes there, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Just two choices, sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You know, many people over the years, especially I recall from back in the 1960s in particular, People were clamoring, wanting to know what life was all about. And I still hear it from time to time. And people have posed that question to me. What really is life all about? Well, there's a number of good answers to that question, a number of simple answers to that question. But I believe one, at least one good answer to that question is that life is all about choices. We all make choices by the dozens each and every day of our lives. Some of those choices are simple and mundane. Let's see, what color socks should I wear today? It does not have too much of an effect on anybody but myself unless I choose one or two of two or three different colors. But other decisions that we make are much more profound. Some are all critical, even life-changing. Some affect only ourselves, while others affect our loved ones. Sometimes choices and decisions can affect an entire nation and even change the course of history itself. When we hear the name Julius Caesar, a number of things come to mind. Shakespeare, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm, I'm not your regular preacher, and, and, but I've asked every congregation I've ever preached for, how many of you like Shakespeare? I find that the brotherhood as a whole does not like Shakespeare. At any rate, so therefore Shakespeare does not come to mind for you, okay? We can move on from there. But things like perhaps the Ides of March or E2 Brute or Roman togas and the like might come to mind. But in reality, Julius Caesar was indeed one of the most brilliant military minds in the history of warfare. However, that military genius coupled with his political ambitions not only made him one of the most colorful characters of the ancient world, but also made him a threat to the powers that be in Rome. Sixty years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, he was appointed governor of Gaul. Gaul was in northern Italy on our maps. It was the northernmost province of the Roman Empire in the ancient world. And he was very popular with his men. Now, that's a very unusual thing for a Roman soldier and a Roman officer. Most of the time, they were quite brutal with their troops, and uh, his tr their troops usually feared them greatly. Julius took care of his soldiers, saw to it they got fed, 
saw to it they got paid. He was very popular with his men. But eventually he was declared an enemy of the state of Rome and thereby ordered to disband his army. Now, if you are a student of history, and I spoke with a student of history this morning uh, a little bit, and I wish she were here tonight, you may know that General Pompey was appointed to see to it that Julius Caesar disbanded his army. And so he took several legions of Rome and went north to meet Julius Caesar to make sure he had complied with the Roman Senate's demand. Well, any time you set that kind of a stage and it becomes a fuel that can be quite volatile. And so, about 49 B.C., Caesar faced a major decision in his life. He had a great choice to make. He could surrender, he could comply with Rome, or he could head south and face Pompey in the might of the Roman Empire. And is not unusual with such occasions, a geographical point played a part. There's a small river that separated Gaul and Italy, known as the Rubicon. In some places, it's much, much more than just a small river, and in some places, not more than just a big stream. But here was the thing. You could come south and get to the brink of the Rubicon. But if you dared cross the Rubicon with an army, it was considered an act of war. It was considered an act of treason. And it became a point of no return. Now history does not record for us perhaps the the agonizing hours spent before making such a decision. We don't know if, if Caesar stayed awake all night or perhaps days on end. We don't know if he was, uh, his digestion was out of whack. We don't know if he paced about. We don't know if he drank. We don't know if he consulted his other officers and, and deliberately and, and consciously decided whether to do this or not. But I can well imagine that he did. And so he decided to take his army and cross the Rubicon. On the southern side, he paused and shouted, A lacta lesta. A lacta lesta. Which means the die is now cast. In other words, we have crossed the river, and we've made a choice, but there's no going back. Hence our own proverbial phrases, crossing the Rubicon and the die is cast. Now I've told you all that to tell you this, that decision affected not only Caesar, and his legions, and their families, but all of the Roman Empire. He was successful in defeating Pompey. And it changed the course of history of Rome for generations. That one decision. Some decisions carry tremendous and even eternal consequences and weight. You know, John wrote in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. That word transgression there, literally in the Greek text, simply means a stepping across. I always think about old Caesar and his stepping across the Rubicon when I run across that word, especially when John wrote those words here. Or sin is exactly that, it's stepping across God's law. Or as we began with in the book of Romans, 
It's either a sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness. All sin can be washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as Brother Bowling put it to us this morning. There is no sin whose stains cannot be removed when the gospel plan of salvation is observed and applied. However, the fact remains that some sin fall into what we might take license to call crossing the Rubicon, maybe even a point no return. Now that's not to say that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot and does not forgive each and every sin. There is no sin that you can commit that cannot be forgiven or washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ in your faithful obedience. But some sins carry a weight with them that an ocean of tears can't wash away the stains and guilt on our hearts that end up there because of them. Much like a pebble tossed into calm waters that the rings go outward and outward and outward, far-reaching. You know, the Golden Gate Bridge was opened in 1937. That was before my time. Maybe not much more, but it was before my time. Over 1,200 people since that time have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge. I've always wanted to ride my motorcycle across the Golden Gate, but uh, the years are creeping up, and I doubt very much I'll get the opportunity to do that anymore. Not everyone who's jumped off of that bridge has lost their life. But those who survive are usually maimed in some terrible way. One such man was interviewed when he was in recovery in the hospital from his little plunge into the bay. And he said to the reporters, I knew. I knew the moment I let go that it was a mistake. Some things, some choices we make letting go of a bridge over 200 feet over the water. It's a little late to take it back. I had a close personal friend who took his life and it affected me a great deal. I suppose he thought that that particular decision was just going to affect him. It affected hundreds who knew him. And we all agonized over it for a long time. Why didn't we see the signs? What was it that he said, or what was it, what did he do that should have alerted us to the fact that he was desperately in trouble? And here it's. 25 years later, and I still wonder. You see, that choice, that decision affected a lot more people than him. I knew a sister in the church who, when she was a young girl, got herself in trouble while at school and got an abortion. And as time went by, then she eventually married. Her and her husband, good friends of mine and Terry's, they have two great young children. And 
She never got over it. The blood of Jesus Christ cleansed that sin from her conscience, from her heart, a long time ago. But that choice, you see, that decision, it never let go of her. The effects of some decisions cannot be undone. Now, I'm old, I'm old enough to admit to you, and since I'm not trying out for the preacher job, I have made some poor choices in my lifetime. If all of us here tonight are honest with ourselves and with each other, we can freely admit, yes, I've made some poor choices in my lifetime. I've made a number of choices that I wish I could go back and change, but that's life. I told my wife not long ago, and, I'm, and let's just set the record straight. Um, Brother Tom never yells at his wife. And I told him flat out, and his wife today, I do yell at my wife. She's Irish, I'm Scottish, we're a fine boisterous Gaelic couple. <laughs> and don't claim to be anything but that, but we love each other. Of all the mistakes and choices I've made in my life, marrying Terry Garrison is not one of those things that I consider to be a mistake. She probably considers her end of it to be a mistake. But I told my son just this past week, I don't remember what brought it up now, I told my son, Ryan, I said, you know something? I'm actually glad. And it took me 37 years to get to this point. 37, right? 37. I'm glad today that I didn't drown you when you were little. I'm even glad I did not yield to the temptation of selling you to the gypsies. Remember what that was about? Something I don't even remember what it was about. But so I've kind of cleared my slate this week. Now, young people, us older folks, are good about giving advice. Well, here comes a little more. Learn early in your life. Let's see, not this. Yeah, there's a couple on this side. Most of them are right there. Learn early in your life. Choices and decisions in your life can affect your entire life. Learn to consciously make good choices. Ones that will not bring you shame. Ones that will not despoil your good name. All of the young people in this congregation have a good name. We're all proud of you. I don't know most of you very well, but I know that this congregation, that the leadership here, that our elders, that our deacons, that our new preacher, when we find him, we'll be proud of you. And when I see you sitting here on a Sunday evening, you make me proud. Make choices and decisions that will never tarnish that name. If something comes up and you are tempted, and I'm not going to list all the things that tempt young people, as many of them tempt us old folks too. If you can just stop and ask yourself, will the people that love me be proud of me for doing this? Will this make my parents people who care about me, proud of me or not. 
When I was a boy, yeah, back in the olden days, I just lived for those hours spent in the woods in the fall of the year. Hunting squirrels and later hunting deer and what have you. Some of the fondest memories I have of my father and my brothers were just those days and hours spent in the squirrel woods. I guess it's a night for poetry because I'm going to read you one. It's one of my favorites. It's by Mr. Robert Frost. You ever happen to travel up north and go to Vermont and you're in a little town of Bennington, be sure to go to the very ancient cemetery up on top of the hill where Mr. Robert Frost is buried there. You'll find his marker that marks his grave, most unusual. This poem reminds me of my father and I read it at his funeral that I preached. Mr. Frost wrote, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it, where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, the less for that for the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Brothers and sisters, serving God is indeed to choose the road less traveled. Joshua put it like this in Joshua chapter 24, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. you choose. Choosing New Testament Christianity is to choose the road less traveled by. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 7, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate or narrow is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few. Be that find it. The narrow gate and the narrow way are the road less traveled. God put it this way in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou may livest mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou may cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now make no mistake, choosing the road less traveled is not necessarily the 
easy road. As much as I hate to quote a Democrat, John Kennedy once said to the American people, and you may remember this, I do, he said, we choose to go to the moon. And he paused just a moment and said, we choose to go to the moon. And then he said, we choose these things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You see, hard choices sometimes offer the greatest reward, like serving Almighty God, like walking the road less traveled. Brothers and sisters, the sad state of affairs in life is the fact that some choices simply never come around again. I have four siblings, two sisters younger than me, two brothers younger than me. And about 1990, we lost the youngest, David. It was tragic. Parents don't usually get over that kind of thing. It was tragic because he was the youngest. At the time, he was 25. What it made it all the more tragic was he was the only one among us, the only of us, who never obeyed the gospel. Some choices, some opportunities, some roads, some doors. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song in just about 20 seconds. And so, once again, there is a choice before you. If you're not a child of God this night, that choice the most important choice of your life is before you. If you are a child of God and you've allowed something to come between you and the Master, if you need the prayers of our elders and your brothers and sisters in Christ, that choice is before you. All of us like to, would like to think we have any number of days yet before us, any number of opportunities yet before us. Maybe we do, or maybe we don't. What I'm suggesting to you this evening is if for some reason your relationship with, the all, with Almighty God is not what it ought to be, don't let another opportunity pass you by. right tonight. Do it now. While together we stand and what we sing. On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of his family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, 
or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or, for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.